Okay, welcome back everyone. This is uh, Grocket OGTV, where we go through the questions in the official guide to the test. This is the GMAT edition. My name's Jim Jacobson. Uh, we left off uh, still going through the questions in the diagnostic exam at the beginning of the beginning of the book. We're in the verbal section. Right now, we're on number 22 on page 34. Whoops. Let's actually write it. So page 34, number 22, we're in the critical reasoning section. So uh, number 22, following several years of declining advertising sales, the Greenville Times reorganized its advertising sales force. Before reorganization, the sales force was organized geographically with some sales representatives concentrating on city center businesses and others concentrating on different outlying regions. The reorganization attempted to increase the sales representative's knowledge of clients' businesses by having each sales representative deal with only one type of industry or of retailing. After the reorganization, revenue from advertising sales increased. Question stem then, in assessing whether the improvement in advertising sales can be properly attributed to the reorganization, it would be most helpful to find out which of the following. So in this particular case, uh, this is another one of those questions where the question stem gives us a little bit of uh, more pinpoint accuracy on, on the element of the question or the element of the passage that we're supposed to concentrate on. In this particular case, we're looking for... Um, and the, the, the format of the question, it would be most helpful to determine which of the following. Um, the passage itself is a causal argument, X causes Y. Um, in order to confirm whether X does in fact cause Y, we need to um, either or both uh, determine that there are no other causes for Y or find additional evidence that X is in fact the cause of Y. Um, with this one, we can't really tell which it's going to be, although when it's in, phrased in the format, um, which of the following would be useful to determine? Um, usually they're going to be pointing at something that could weaken the argument if it turned out to be true. So that's what we're looking for, something that could provide another cause for the revenue from advertising sales to increase if it were true. So um, choice A, what proportion of the total revenue of the Greenville Times is generated by advertising sales? So in this particular case, the proportion of advertising sales to total revenue is irrelevant. Uh, it would be the same, well, it wouldn't necessarily be the same if, since the advertising revenues increased, but uh, the proportion has nothing to do with the cause of the increase in revenue. So this is uh, outside the scope of the passage, really, not choice A. Choice B, has the circulation of the Greenville Times increased substantially in the last two years? So an increase in circulation, um, sort of independent of the reorganization, if more, if more, we're assuming this is a newspaper, it doesn't actually say, but let's just pretend. Um, if, if it is a newspaper, if more people are buying this newspaper, um, that's another way that revenue could increase with uh, advertising sales being static. So um, in this particular case, this could be a really good other cause for the increase in revenue independent of the reorganization. We get a smiley face for choice B, but let's keep looking. Choice C. Among all the types of industry and retailing that use the Greenville Times as an advertising vehicle, which type accounts for the largest proportion of the newspaper's advertising sales? Well, in, in terms of the passage, um, we actually don't have any information about different proportions of retail versus industries or things like that. Uh, they're basically all equal as far as the passage is concerned. Um, and therefore, it's not really something that would give another cause for the revenue to increase. For example, um, if there had been something in the passage saying that there was a boom in industry or, wow, their retail sales have really decreased relative to industry, uh, that might give us another cause, maybe. But uh, these are two kind of neutral things with regard to our particular revenue issue, so it can't be choice C. On choice D, um, do any clients of the sales representatives of the Greenville Times have a standing order with the Times for a fixed amount of advertising per month? Um, fixed accounts, of course, are great ways to provide steady revenue, uh, and that would be interesting to know if you were the CEO of Greenville 
Times News Corp or something like that. Um, th but this one, and so this one is clearly meant to attract the business minds out there who are going on to do their MBA. Uh, but really, it's irrelevant to what increased the revenue uh, for the for the newspaper or for the Greenville Times, whatever that is. Uh, choice E. Among the advertisers in the Greenville Times, are there more types of retail business or more types of industrial business? And again, this is this is another one of these false false splits, you know, differentiating between things that don't actually make a difference to our to our um, to our argument. Um, more types of them. We've give, been given no information that the type or a change in the type of, of industry or retailing business. Um, we've given, been given no information that different types produce different amounts of revenue. If it did turn out that some types were much more lucrative, and then we found out that there were also more of those all of a sudden, um, coinciding with this reorganization, that could be an increase in the cause of revenue. But we don't have that. That's all information that's outside the scope of the passage. It can't be choice E. So back to the other one that we first liked, choice B, where circulation provides another cause for the increase in revenue. That is the correct answer. On to the next one. And so we're going on to page 35 now with number 23. Page 35, question 23. Okay. So motorists in a certain country frequently complain that traffic congestion is much worse now than it was 20 years ago. No real measure of how much traffic congestion there was 20 years ago exists, but the motorists' complaints are almost certainly unwarranted. The, con the country's highway capacity has tripled in the last 20 years thanks to a vigorous highway construction program, whereas the number of automob automobiles registered in the country has increased by only 75%. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument? This is one of those interesting ones where, um, well, they're all interesting, of course, because we all love the GMAT. But uh, in this particular case, it's interesting for two reasons. One is that the question stem doesn't actually give us that additional bit of information. It doesn't give us the uh, pinpoint accuracy of the particular aspect of the passage that we're supposed to concentrate on. The other element that's interesting is that this is one of those cases where the conclusion does not appear as the first or the last sentence in the passage. So the conclusion is ultimately, or the argument, is ultimately the middle bit, where it says, the motorist's complaints are almost certainly unwarranted. Um, so that's the conclusion. We don't necessarily have to attack the conclusion to weaken it. It's usually the assumption that we're after, um, but uh, or some element of the construction of the statement rather than the final um, summary. Um, in any case, so we need to weaken the argument that the motorist's complaint are unwarrant complaints are unwarranted, which means that they actually are right that traffic is more congested. Our evidence is that um, highway capacity has tripled um, where there's only a 75% increase in the number of automobile automobiles. So we would need another reason why um, congestion could still be a real thing despite this massive relative increase in highway construction. So let's take a look at the answers. So choice A, most automobile travel is local and the networks of roads and streets in the country's settled areas have changed little over the past 20 years. So this is actually pretty good uh, given the prediction that we were hoping to make. Um, this gives us a reason why some parts um, in fact, most travel, as perceived by motorists, uh, would could would and could still be very congested if the city roads and streets are still the same as they were 20 years ago. Um, the massive construction of highways connecting the cities would not necessarily alleviate the this feeling of congestion, congestion where the 75% increase in the number of registered vehicles absolutely would with unchanged roadways in the city. So choice A is awesome. We are very happy with that one, but again, we want to be thorough. Uh, part of the trick, or part of the part of your goal in your studies on the GMAT, should not only be to correctly identify the um, the right answer as quickly as possible, but in order to really understand the GMAT and to uh, 
maximize your chances of getting any given question right, you should also study the patterns and the wrong answer choices, especially in the official guide. Um, trends and patterns in there make it as easy to, uh, in some cases, you know, sometimes the, the right answer is harder for you to recognize for whatever reason. The logic escapes you or you, you read something wrong. Um, but being able to uh, do it by process of elimination still gets you the right answer. So that's why we're always going through the wrong answer choices as well. Oh, I just gave away the choice A was the correct answer. Sorry about that. Well, we're still going to go through the other ones. Anyway, uh, choice B. Uh, gasoline prices are high, and miles traveled per car per year have not changed much in the last 20 years. So gasoline prices of course are completely irrelevant to the feeling to the perception of congestion so um, that part is useless miles traveled per car per year also basically irrelevant you can have congestion over long stretches of highway over long distances you can have uh, congestion over the space of a couple blocks so distance and gasoline prices way outside the scope of the passage uh, choice C the country's urban centers have well-developed public transit systems that carry most of the people who commute into those centers. Now, if anything, this actually would um, weaken the the it would, it would strengthen the argument that they may well be um, uh, noticing congestion, um, or at least it's it's an argument um, that they're that their perception is unwarranted because if there's this much um, mass transit, most of the people who are downtown aren't even in traffic. They're riding buses and subways and, and things like that. So um, choice C is totally the wrong thing. Choice D, the average age of automobiles registered in the country is lower now than it was 20 years ago. Well, aside from that being somewhat unlikely, because vehicles last longer nowadays, we're not actually supposed to use outside knowledge like that. But in, in this particular case, the average age, age of the automobiles, automobiles is, again, irrelevant to the idea of congestion. So, again, way outside the scope. And choice E, uh, radio stations have long been broadcasting regular traffic reports that inform motorists about traffic congestion. You know, I, I feel like of the wrong answer choices, this one is at least moderately tempting. Um, because it does actually address the issue of congestion, unlike the other wrong answer choices. Um, in this particular case, though, uh, the, the, what it's suggesting is that uh, motorists have a heightened awareness of congestion, something that they wouldn't have had 20 years ago. If anything, though, this is an argument um, in favor of what the uh, what the author of the passage is saying, namely that motorists feel like there is congestion, but there isn't actually, and so this this one creates this notion of um, perception, but not reality. Uh, so we're not actually after something like that. We need something that says the congestion is reality. So frowny face aside, that leaves us with choice A, the one that looked absolutely awesome initially. see still page 35 why did I just erase it I guess I get to write the number 35 again page 35 that 35 looks so much better than the previous one number 24 So the percentage of households with an annual income of more than forty thousand dollars is higher in Merton County than in any other county However, the percentage of households with an annual income of $60,000 or more is higher in Summer County. If the statements above are true, which of the following must also be true? Now, probably there's going to be something in the answer choices relating to the average versus the actual numbers, maybe, or um, the way that averages are computed. We can tell that just from, from the question, from the passage itself, because it's all about the averages and there aren't any other really elements to it. So we need to find something that must be true if we take um, the above as true, which basically means uh, we're making an inference. So choice A, um, the percentage of households with an annual income of $80,000 um, is higher in Summer County than in Merton County. So this is one of those things that could be true, but is not necessarily true. It's not a must be true based on what the passage says. All the passage says is that in Summer County, they have the highest percentage with an annual income of 60,000 or more. In fact, they could all have 60,000. Um, and so, and that would still be true relative 
to the terms of the passage. Um, and yeah, so basically choice A cannot possibly be right. It's not a must be true, it's a might be true. Uh, choice B, Merton County has the second highest percentage of households with an annual income of 60000 or more. Well, that, that certainly could be true. All we know about Merton County is that they have the highest percentage at 40 or higher. Um, they may have the second highest at 60. They may not. Um, it's not something that needs to be true, uh, given what we have in this passage. So it's a maybe yes, maybe no, which is not what we need here. Choice C. Some households in Merton County have an annual income between 40000 and 60000 so this suggests that it absolutely is true, um, because in order for it to be true that the uh, Summer County has the highest percentage of those 60,000 or more, um, and in order for the average annual income uh, in Merton County to be 40,000 or higher, um, they actually need to have some annual, some with an annual income between 40 and 60. Uh, if they're above 60, they would end up competing with Summer County. But in order to establish that higher than 40k average, they need to have some between 40 and 60. So this sounds awesome. Yay. Okay. But let's check the other ones just to see what things the official guide has given us in terms of wrong answer choices. Choice D. The number of households with an annual income of more than $40,000 is greater in Merton County than in Summer County. So I alluded to the, at, at the beginning the notion of comparing uh, percents versus actual value, and this is a recurring um, issue on both the verbal, uh, especially in critical reasoning, and on the quantitative side of things, that um, actual numbers and ratios are not the same thing. Um, you can determine ratios with actual numbers, but you can't necessarily determine actual numbers from ratios without um, getting some of the actual numbers. So in this particular case, um, the number is outside the scope of this particular question because we don't have the numbers for Summer County. Knowing that there's more in Merton than in Summer doesn't really change anything because the question itself is about percentages. So you go away, choice D. A choice E, the average annual household income is higher in Summer County than in Merton County. And on the surface, this sounds like it, it would have to be true uh, because Summer has the higher percentage of those above 60. Um, however, it, it's pretty easy to come up with numbers that uh, make this not true. So if we say this is Merton here and this is Summer. So if we say that Merton County has 10 houses in it, let's pretend it's pretty sparsely inhabited. So if we have 10 homes, each of them at, um, let's say, $45,000, the average is going to be $45,000. Whereas if Summer County has only two homes in it, they are giant or just really far apart with huge, huge areas of land. Let's say there's only two houses. Um, we have one at 10000 and uh, one at 70,000, the average is going to equal 40,000 because 70 plus 10 is 80 divided by the two houses gives us an average of 40,000 per house. So this is still true for the terms of the passage, namely that Merton has a higher percentage uh, at 40,000 or higher, whereas Summer has the higher percentage at 60,000 or higher. Summer has 50% of its houses um, above 60,000. Merton has zero, so Summer still wins on percentage, but its average annual income is still lower than that of Merton, so choice E is not necessarily true. We draw a line through that one. Choice C, as we saw originally, is still the good one. On to the next page. After a brief pause while I erase things. All right, page 36, number 25.
Tiger beetles are such fast runners that they can capture virtually any non-flying insect. However, when running toward an insect, a tiger beetle will intermittently stop and then, a moment later, resume its attack. Perhaps the beetles cannot maintain their pace and must pause for a moment's rest. But an alternative hypothesis is that while running, tiger beetles are unable to adequately process the resulting rapidly changing visual information and so quickly go blind and stop. Interesting. I have no idea if that's true or not, but it would be interesting if it were true. Which of the following, if discovered in experiments using artificially moved prey insects, would support one of the two hypotheses and undermine the other? So when we get a question like this, we do need to refresh our memory about what those two hypotheses are. Uh, one of them is that tiger beetles just get tired out. They, they run really fast, but they get tired out and have to rest for a little bit, and then they start running again. The other option is that it's not that they get tired, but that it's difficult for them to... Um, chase something, you know, they have those little insect brains, and so they're just not that smart. Their brains get overloaded and they have to stop because they can't really see anymore. They have to pause for a moment and re-get it. So, do they get tired, or do they um, go blind, basically, from too much visual information? The correct answer choice will strengthen one and thereby weaken the other. So choice A, when a prey insect is moved directly toward a beetle that has been chasing it, the beetle immediately stops and runs away without its usual intermittent stopping. Well, in, in this particular case, having it stop and run away doesn't really do anything for either of our hypotheses. You know, we needed it to be tired or for it to get confused from too much information, too much visual information. Having it stop and run away because something goes towards it, that's some whole other issue that we don't really need to worry about because it can't be right. Uh, choice B. In pursuing a swerving insect, a beetle alters its course while running, and its pauses become more frequent as the chase progresses. So swerving, you know, means it's going in kind of a snaky fashion, changing its direction frequently. Um, and if that's the case, the more the more the insect swerves, the more the beetle stops. That ab absolutely supports the hypothesis that it's the visual information, the overabundance of visual information, that makes its little bug brain overload and has to stop. So this one sounds pretty good, but let's just be sure. Uh, choice C. In pursuing a moving insect, a beetle usually responds immediately to changes in the insect's direction, and it pauses equally frequently, whether the chase is up or down an incline. So in this particular case, since it pauses equally frequently, whether it's up or down, um, and and it responds immediately to changes in the insect's direction, it's, a, it's basically saying that it, it is neither getting tired nor going blind. It's able to handle uh, changes in direction instantly, pauses the same amount going up and down. Um, because it affects both things equally, this can't possibly strengthen one of our hypotheses and weaken the other. So it's not C. Choice D, if when a beetle pauses, it is not gained on the insect it is pursuing, the beetle generally ends its pursuit. So this is definitely outside the scope of what we're after. This talks about what happens if it isn't catching up to the other insect. Um, we, The stuff we're looking at is what happens, what causes it to stop, not what, or excuse me, we're, we're after what causes it to pause before resuming. This is all about what would cause it to stop and then just give up and go back to its other beetle business. Um, in this particular case, then, totally outside the scope of what we're after, not the right answer. Choice E. The faster a beetle pursues an insect fleeing directly away from it, the more frequently the beetle stops. So on the surface, this sounds like it might talk about it being tired because it's going faster, and the faster it goes, the more it stops. Um, but still, the original um, the original passage actually does still account for this being it going blind. Um, it says that it may be that while running, tiger beetles are unable to adequate, adequately process the resulting rapidly changing visual information. Going fast, period, um, r produces a faster rate of visual information, unless the beetles are chasing these fake insects down completely featureless tunnels. Um, which is unlikely, that rapidly changing visual information um, is going to go faster also if the beetle is running faster. So um, pausing more often when it runs faster is not enough to differentiate going blind versus going getting tired. So it's not choice E. Leaving us back with this other one, with the insect that changes its path often, causing the beetle to stop more often, suggests that it's 
having vision problems. Therefore, choice B is the correct one. On to number 26. So guillemots are birds of arctic regions. They feed on fish that gather beneath thin sheets of floating ice, and they nest on nearby land. Guillemots need 80 consecutive snow-free days in a year to raise their chicks. So until average temperatures in the arctic began to rise, recent, began to rise recently, the guillemots' range was limited to the southernmost arctic coast. Therefore, if the warming continues, the guillemots' range will probably be enlarged by being extended northward along the coast. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument? So, um, in this case, the argument in question, we do need to go back and refresh our memory briefly, is the last sentence. If warming continues, the guillemot's range will probably be enlarged. So, um, global warming leads to increased range because they, they need 80 consecutive snow-free days. In order to weaken that conclusion, we need some other reason why they they would not have their range extended. Okay, so something other than the temperature. So choice A. Even if the warming trend continues, there will still be years in which the guillemot chicks are killed by an unusually early snow. Well, this doesn't, this doesn't really introduce anything about um, their range, the conclusion about their range. Yeah, there will be some tough years, but that was true before and it'll be true after. If anything, it... Um, just the, just being some years uh, doesn't really weaken the argument at all, so it's not choice A. Choice B. If the Arctic warming continues, the Guillemot's current predators are likely to succeed in extending their own range further north. So again, the argument was not that the Guillemot is going to have an easier time, um, just that its range is going to be increased. So um, whatever predators the Guillemot has, uh, if they are more successful, that's great for the predators and bad for the birds, uh, but irrelevant to the argument about their range being increased. Choice C. Guillemots nest in coastal areas where temperatures are generally higher than in inland areas. That's nice. Uh, I'm not actually sure that tells us anything new that isn't uh, actually isn't in the passage. We find out from the passage that they um, they, eat, they eat fish beneath thin ice and nest on nearby land. That sounds like you would need to be on a coast, so choice C really is nothing new. Certainly doesn't tell us anything about um, weakening their range. Um, choice D, if the Arctic warming continues, much of the thin ice in the southern Arctic will disappear. So this is interesting. Um, their range is, you know, these coastal areas, um, and having more warm days should increase the their range along these coastal areas. However, another aspect of their of their expansion or or their ecology, I suppose, is that they feed on fish that gather beneath thin sheets of floating ice. If the thin ice of the southern Arctic will disappear, they probably will not be able to ex expand their range because their major food source isn't going to be there for them. So the fish the thin ice, the thin ice fish, whatever kind of fish hang out under thin ice um, that the guillemot eats, those are a factor in its range. So this is pretty tempting. Let's check out E. The fish that guillemots eat are currently preyed on by a wider variety of predators in the southernmost Arctic regions than they are farther north. Well, this is a false split. Um, it doesn't. We don't care really what other things eat these fish. Um, all we're talking about is, will the guillemot be able to eat these these fish, whatever they are, in a wider area? Um, and if the ice disappears, as it did in choice D, that would be a reason that their range would not expand. So, D is correct. Up to page 37, number 28. Okay. 
So, Gortland has long been narrowly self-sufficient in both grain and meat. However, as per capita income in Gortland has risen toward the world average, per capita consumption of meat has also risen toward the world average, and it takes several pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. Therefore, since per capita income continues to rise, whereas domestic grain production will not increase, Gortland will soon have to import either grain or meat or both. A grim situation for Gortland. But, which of the following is an assumption on which the argument depends? So, with predictions and uh, forecasts, um, which is what this is, that, you know, if, if things keep, if, if uh, since uh, per capita income continues to rise, grain production will not rise, Gortland will so soon have to import grain or meat or both, that's a prediction, a forecast. When you're asked to identify the assumption, very often the assumption is going to be that um, all other aspects of the um, that led to the prediction are going to continue as they were. That basically that uh, the uh, the elements that are leading to the predicted outcome, none of those are going to change. That's an underlying assumption to every forecast. Okay, so we we probably want something like that. Um, so, choice A, the total acreage devoted to grain production in Gortland will soon decrease. So there is a, a prediction that they're going to have to import grain. However, we don't actually need the acreage devoted to grain production to decrease in order for this negative prediction to come about. Okay, um, It's enough. The prediction will still come true even if the acreage devoted to grain production stays the same. So choice A would make the prediction more likely to be true, but it's not an assumption on which it depends. Choice B, importing either grain or meat will not result in a significantly higher percentage of Gortlander's incomes being spent on food than is currently the case. Um, yeah, this is outside the scope in multiple aspects. We're not really worried about the consumer... Um, higher percentage of their incomes in this particular case. Um, we are worried about their behavior, uh, again, because there's this, you know, per capita income is going to increase, grain production not. Um, but in this particular case, um, it may be true that importing one or the other or both of those two things may change the percentage, but that's not what the prediction is ultimately about. Choice C, the per capita consumption of meat in Gortland is increasing at roughly the same rate across all income levels. Um, this may be true, and it certainly would um, strengthen the argument if this were true, but it's not an assumption on which it depends. Even if only a small percentage of Gortland's population, or if certain demographics are eating more grain and more meat, um, meat in particular with this particular answer choice, even if 20% of them are eating more, it's still going to lead to a shortage. So the prediction will still come true, um, even if they're not increasing equally across all income levels. So this is not an assumption on which the argument depends. Uh, D, the per capita income of meat producers in Gortland is rising faster than the per capita income of grain producers. This is another one of these false splits. It has nothing to do with um, our forecast here. So the incomes of the producers is completely outside the scope of what we're after here. Process of elimination suggests that choice E is the right one, and of course if you're further on on the GMAT you might just choose it on this basis because all the other answer choices are clearly wrong, but we need to be thorough. Uh, choice E, people in Gortland who increase their consumption of meat will not radically decrease their consumption of grain. So this actually is something um, on which the argument depends. Um, if the people who are increasing their consumption of meat really, really reduced their uh, consumption of grain, uh, it would not necessarily be the case that they would need to import. For example, uh, you know, if it takes several pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat, if these people go to not eating any grain at all, um, it is not necessarily the case that um, that they'll have to start to import because all of the grain could go towards meat production. So, 
choice E is, is, is the choice that results in some of the factors leading to the forecast changing. That's what we were after all along. So choice E is our buddy. Let's see. Number 29. Still on page 37. So the Hazleton Coal Processing Plant is a major employer in the Hazleton area, but national environmental regulations will force it to close if it continues to use old polluting processing methods. However, to update the plant to use newer, cleaner methods would be so expensive that the plant will close unless it receives the tax break it has requested. In order to prevent a major increase in local unemployment, the Hazleton government is considering granting the plant's request. So which of the following would be most important for the Hazleton government to determine before deciding whether to grant the plant's request? When you're given a, a question like this, you definitely want to go back uh, to see what the reason was for their considering the request. So, uh, and then we find that in the last sentence. In order to prevent a major increase in local unemployment, the Hazleton government is considering granting the plant's request. So if that's their reason, the most important thing for them to determine is that whatever their decision is, it's not going to increase unemployment, since that's their reason for even considering this. We, in real life, obviously, the Hazleton government would be considering a great many other factors, but for this passage, we need to take it as if it is just the one thing. So we need something relating to unemployment in our answer choice. Uh, choice A, uh, do they need to know whether the company that owns the plant would open a new plant in another area if the present plant were closed? Um, unless it so happened that that other area would still employ Hazleton residents, uh, the opening of we're not worried about the owners of the plant. They're going to be okay as far as the Hazleton government is concerned one way or another. Uh, Hazleton is only concerned about its own residents who are employees of the plant. So if they move the plant to some other area, Hazleton government still loses out. They're worried about jobs. Uh, choice B, uh, should the government worry whether the plant would employ far fewer workers when updated than it does now? So this one relates directly to employment. Let's just say that the new updates make it so efficient they have to lay off half their workers. That would be something that the, um, that the government would worry about. But let's keep looking. Uh, choice C, whether, should they wonder whether the level of pollutants presently being emitted by the plant is high enough to constitute a health hazard for local residents? So again, this is one of those outside knowledge things where if you were on a city council or in a local government, you had better care about this. But um, in terms of the passage, we only can go with what we're given. All the government cares about is employment. So health hazard, who cares? Um, Choice D, whether the majority of the coal processed by the plant is sold outside the Hazleton area. Another economic concern that would matter, um, you know, to a real government, but again, doesn't relate to the employment issue stated in the passage. Choice E, whether the plant would be able to process more coal when updated than it does now. Again, output of the plant, not in the scope of our passage or our question in this particular case. So choice B was the only one that dealt with the employment issue as stated in the passage. So choice B, they would care whether the updated plant would also employ far fewer workers. Um, yeah, so choice B it is. Still page 37, number 30. So a physically active lifestyle has been shown to help increase longevity. In the Wistar region, region of Bellaria, the average age at death is considerably higher than in any other part of the country. Wistar is the only mountainous part of Bellaria. A mountainous terrain makes even such basic activities as walking relatively strenuous. It essentially imposes a physically active lifestyle on people. Clearly, this circumstance explains the long lives of people in Wistar. Uh, so which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument? 
This is another one of those causal arguments that, you know, x causes y. And to, the shortcut for weakening these causal arguments is one of two things. Um, you either need to reverse the causal argument or the causal relationship. You say, no, it's, it's not x that causes y. It's y that causes x. I should label this to weaken. So instead of um, the mountainous region causing greater health, we could say that the health causes the mountainous region. That doesn't make sense in this case. The other way to weaken causal arguments is to find a different cause. It's not x that causes y, but z that causes y. And that's the more common of them, but just know that both of these can actually happen. Uh, so this is a big shortcut. We basically just need to, in order to weaken this causal argument that this um, higher um, average age of death is caused by healthful mountain walking, we need to find another reason for the high, higher average age of death. That will weaken the argument. Okay, so choice A. In Bellaria, all medical expenses are paid by the government so that personal income does not affect the quality of, of health care a person receives. So quality of health care, I suppose, is related to, potentially related to the average age of death. Um, but the um, Bellaria is the entire region, and we're worried specifically, not worried, we are interested in specifically the Wistar region. So um, th since choice A applies to the whole region, um, it doesn't explain why this one area um, would have the higher average age of death, not A. Uh, choice B, the Wistar region is one of Bellaria's least populated regions. So again, this is another one of those cases where we are pitting um, percentages and averages versus the actual numbers. Um, there could only be two people living there, and then they just have a very, at any given time, and then just end up with a really high average death age. So um, it being the least populated does not actually give us a reason for the higher average. Can't be B. Choice C. Many people who live in the Wistar region have moved there in middle age or upon retirement. So this is very good actually, because basically, if there are very few young people in the Wistar region, um, you will have very few young people dying in the Wistar region, bringing the average down. So if the average age is quite old, uh, the average age of death will also be quite old. So this sounds a lot like what we're after. Yay! Big toothy grin for that one. Choice D. Uh, the many opportunities for hiking, skiing, and other outdoor activities that Wistar's mountains offer make it a favorite destination for vacation, vacationing Bellarians. Um, if you think about it, this would actually probably strengthen the argument more than anything else. Um, because if you have a lot of people vacationing there, you would have a lot of people vacationing at all ages, um, which in theory should uh, lower the average age of death, um, because you have people of all ages there. Um, but more than anything, it's really just outside the scope of the passage. We, we care about people dying there, not people vacationing there. Choice E, per capita spending on recreational activities is no higher in Wistar than it is in other regions of Bellaria. Um, yeah, spending on recreational activities does nothing uh, to explain the age of death. So choice C is the only one that should have tempted us. And it's the correct answer, so that's good. Okay. On to page 38, number 31. Page 38. Number 31. Cheever College offers several online courses via remote computer connection, in addition to traditional classroom-based courses. A study of student performance at Cheever found that, overall, the average student grade for online courses matched that for classroom-based courses. In this calculation of the average grade, course withdrawals were weighted as equivalent to a course failure and the rate of withdrawal was much lower for students enrolled in classroom-based courses than for students enrolled in online courses. If the statements above are true, which of the following must also be true of Cheever College? 
So we're not given any additional pointers in the question stem about what aspect we're supposed to concentrate on. Um, this is an inference question. Uh, you know, if all that's true, which of these also must be true? That's a classic inference question format. So we just have to tackle each answer choice um, in order and decide which one must be true based on the information we've been given. So choice A. Among the students who did not withdraw, students enrolled in online courses got higher grades on average than students enrolled in classroom-based courses. So that's interesting. So let's just kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, online courses and classroom courses have the same grades. However, um, this is from the, the passage itself. They have the same grades, but online courses have more withdrawals than classroom courses and all withdrawals are considered failing grades for purposes of that GPA average that they were figuring. So we need a reason, or there needs to, well, there, there needs to be a reason, that's not what the question is asking, but uh, there needs to be a reason why the online class, class classes grades are still the same despite having more failing grades on the roster. Basically the only way that could be is if the grades that they do have that are not failing are on average higher. So um, they have higher overall grades, but more people failing, either because they fail or they withdraw, whereas the classroom courses have lower average grades, but fewer people withdrawing, which would count as an F. So that's actually what Choice A is saying, that among students who did not withdraw, they stayed in and got grades, students enrolled in online courses got higher grades on average than students enrolled in classroom-based courses. That provides the balance to the greater number of Fs that they are using in their computation. Choice A there's basically no way it can be one of the other answer choices, but we'll still look at them. And it gets a smile, because it's awesome. So choice B, um, must it be true that the number of students enrolled per course at the start of the school term is much higher on average for the online courses than the classroom-based courses? Um, no, it, it need not be true, because we're dealing with average grades, not... Um, not the actual numbers of these things. So again, this is another one of those cases of actual numbers versus ratios um, rearing its ugly head in wrong answer choices. It can't be choice B. Uh, choice C, there are no students who take both an online and a classroom-based course in the same school term. They're trying to make this sound like an overlapping sets issue where, where we're worried about how many are actually in each set. Since we're dealing with averages, it actually doesn't matter whether every single student is in both. Um, all we care about are the averages in the actual separate types of classes, online versus classroom. So it's irrelevant to the averages or to our problem whether they are in both, whether any students are in both. Um, choice D, among Cheever College students with the best grades, a significant majority take online rather than classroom-based courses. Um, so the majority of those with the best grades taking online courses still doesn't necessarily address um, the other aspects of the average because um, we don't know how many there are with the best grades. Uh, if there's only a small number, they aren't going to be enough to affect the average. So we need um, something that describes a greater number of the students than just the ones who are getting the very best grades. It's not D. Um, choice E, courses offered online tend to deal with subject matter that is less challenging than that of classroom-based courses. So that, that may well be true, but it's irrelevant for the purposes of the, of the problem. It, it's not something that needs to be true uh, based on the passage. It, they could be harder classes, and if the rest of the passage is still true, um, which it is, um, then choice E is invalidated. So um, choice E offers an explanation, uh, a possible explanation, but it's not one that's required to explain why the online students are getting better grades on average, or the same grades on average uh, with far more Fs in the class. So choice E, not it. Choice A, the one that totally explained the discrepancy um, or the uh, paradox in the um, in the passage, that one is the right answer. All right, number thirty-two, still on page thirty-eight.
Okay. For years, the beautiful Renaissance buildings in Palitito have been damaged by exhaust from the many tour buses that come to the city. There's been little parking space, so most buses have idled at the curb during each stop on their tour, and idling produces as much exhaust as driving. The city has now provided parking that accommodates a third of the tour buses, so damage to Palatito's buildings from the bus's exhaust will di diminish significantly. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the argument? So the argument here is um, um, basically the last two lines on the page in the passage where it says, so damage to Palatito's buildings from bus's exhaust will di diminish significantly. So in order to support that, we need to strengthen the idea that lots of damage was coming from idling buses. So in order, in order for this to be a significant reduction, um, even though it's only a third of the buses that don't have to, that have parking now, um, in order for that to really be a big difference, we needed a lot of the damage to come from idling rather than from other sources. So, uh, choice A, the exhaust from Palatito's few automobiles is not a significant threat to Palatito's buildings. Hey, that that's great for their buildings, um, but if they're no significant threat, then they're no relevance to our argument here. So it can't be this one. Choice B, Palatito's Renaissance buildings are not threatened by pollution other than exhaust, or engine exhaust. Also great for the buildings, also irrelevant. We're dealing specifically with supporting this notion that parking for the buses is going to make things much better for the buildings. If there aren't other threats, that still doesn't strengthen the idea that only parking a third of the buses is going to be great. Choice C, tour buses typically spend less than one quarter of the time they are in Palatito transporting passengers from one site to another. So it doesn't say this, but what this means is if they're only spending one quarter of their time transporting passengers, they are spending three quarters of their time sitting around idling. So this one says that a lot of the time is spent idling. So this is certainly a tempting answer for our to strengthen our argument because we needed something that said, "Hey, you know, idling was causing a lot of a lot of the exhaust damage." So, we'll give that one a nice little smile. Uh, choice D: More tourists come to Palatito by tour bus than by any other single means of transportation. Now, the fact that they arrive there by tour bus is certainly. Uh, sounds it sounds like it has potential but we really do need to have it be uh, more more of a fine point um, because what we're dealing with here is buses exhaust from idling buses buses that are just sitting there with the engine running so um, the fact that tourists are coming there from somewhere else all that exhaust is coming out you know on the roads on the way to Palatito uh, so that's kind of outside the scope of our of our passage here uh, choice E. Some of the tour buses that are unable to find parking drive around Palatito while their passengers are visiting a site. So this is basically the, the same... Th this basically doesn't change anything. We find out from the passage that they put out the same amount of exhaust whether they're driving or just sitting there with the engine running. Um, because the buses don't have some place to park, um, you know, right outside the buildings, um, it's still going to produce the same amount of exhaust damaging the buildings, and so this is kind of neutral for our argument. We need something that says the parking is going to make a big difference, where the where the buses can just sit there and not be on, you know, not have the engine running. That's the whole point of the parking of the buses. So, uh, choice E, driving versus idling, doesn't make a difference. Choice C must be correct. Hmm. I hesitate to do one more because I think uh, I, there's only, on my clock, only uh, four minutes left, and I just want to make sure I don't have to cut off an explanation. We're supposed to keep these uh, shows to an hour. So we'll stop there. Uh, this has been uh, Grocket's OGTV, the GMAT edition, where we go through the questions in the official guide. My name is Jim Jacobson, and next time we will pick up on page 39 with question number 33. Hope to see you then.